Welcome again to Victory Family Church. Hope you're having an awesome weekend. Yeah, seven of you are excited to be here. The rest of you will be in a second. Uh, so thanks for coming. Um, thanks for coming back after Easter weekend. Uh, you know, I figured some of you wouldn't see you till Christmas, but you're here. So happy to have you back. Um, we're starting a new series today called I Doubt It, Skeptics Welcome. And uh, so really, really excited to be able to next several weeks kind of go through and talk about some of the different doubts that all of us have. And the reality is all of us have doubts. You may not all uh, have doubts in, in your faith, but we all have doubts at certain points in our lives. Like every one of you, when you're a teenager, you doubt if your parents know anything, right? Some of you as parents, uh, when your kids are teenagers, you doubt if they're going to make it out of their teenage years, right? You're like, I'm going to kill this kid, right? So you just, you doubt it. Some of you uh, doubt that I have the ability to preach a sermon in 30 minutes. Like, I get it. You, you doubt it. Some of you doubt that Texas will ever win a national championship. Like, I don't know. Like, we all have certain amount of doubts in our lives. But somewhere along the way in Christianity, it's as if you have a, a doubt, then all of a sudden people may say, uh, you're a lesser believer, or some circles may say you're not a believer at all if there's any doubts. But, like, when I read Scripture, when I see all the great heroes in the Old Testament and even the disciples in the New Testament, all of them at times in their journey of faith had certain amount of doubts. So we want you to know if you have doubts, you're welcome here. If you're skeptical about what we're doing or who God is, you are welcome here. Hey, look, look, look at the disciples. One of them was known for his doubt. Like, right, everyone knows who I'm talking about, right? You, you know, Doubting Thomas. Like, we know. It's like Negative Nancy. It's just a name that, that stuck. Some of you have been called a Doubting Thomas, and your name is not even Thomas, right? Can you imagine, like, Thomas just chilling up in heaven right now? Like, guys, it's been 2,000 years. Can you give it a rest? Like, I get it. I get it. I had some issues back then, but come on. Like, he was a part of the crew that took the gospel to the nations of the earth, and now billions of people worship Jesus, and here we are, like, Doubting Thomas is like, come on. So over the next over the next few weeks, we're going to try to uh, not necessarily answer all your questions, but maybe help give you a framework to be able to work through some of your questions. So next week we'll talk about, I doubt if God can use me. I think so many times we have some of those doubts of, uh, I don't know enough. I, I'm not, I, I didn't go to, like, I'm not educated enough when it comes to, to scripture, or maybe we think I disqualified myself from God ever wanting to use me. And so uh, next week we'll talk about I doubt God can use me. And then in two weeks we're going to talk about I doubt this whole thing's real. And so I'm pretty excited uh, to go through. Like some of you think, I, don't, I, I doubt God's real. I doubt this is the only way, this Christian thing is the only way to get to heaven. How do we really know? I doubt that the Bible is infallible. So uh, we're going to talk about it. But today I want to talk about, I doubt that I can make it through this. Has anybody ever been in a situation where, like, man, you, you feel like this is a tough spot. And somebody tells you, oh, you're going to be okay. Everything's going to be just fine. And your thought process is, I doubt it, right? Like everything's going fine for you, but for me right now, you just need to shut up, right? Like, I doubt it. Uh, a few years, I think it was three years ago, around, around this time, there was a, a massive storm. Uh, one, one of the tornadoes that came through and uh, several people in our community died. Several families in our church lost their, lost their homes. And we, we were at home, uh, me, Christy, uh, my two kids, and Shana was actually at our house that night. And, and so we're watching the news. Storms are coming. And it was one of the times where they said, this could be one of the big ones, right? It's like all the atmospheric conditions and then the hook echo is and then blah, 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 blah. The Gettners saying that, whatever. And so you know you're preaching a sermon in Oklahoma when you use the word Gettner. Right, and and so one of the one of the one of the weather guys he said he said if you are in your home this is a type of storm that unless you're underground you will not survive. So I didn't have a storm I didn't have a storm shelter and so I told Chris I was like let's roll and so I got Christy I got the two kids Shana in the, in in the back of the car and we we're like we got to get out of here and so we left apparently all of humanity heard that same message and we get out of our of our neighborhood on the road and it's like gridlock so we're trying to i was like i'll just we'll just head south it'll be no big deal we'll get out of the way and and everybody else thought the same thing and so like we're like about a mile from our house it's been 20 minutes things are getting substantially worse because i thought i left with plenty of time things are getting substantially worse so I said, forget it we're just gonna go back home i would i would i would rather be in my closet 
then in this car. And so we turn back around, uh, get back on actually I-44, I- and then on the, the off-ramp to get back to my house. I'm close. I am like a quarter of a mile from my house, and seven power, power poles just snap right in front of us. And so all these power lines are just on the road, maybe four or five cars in front of us, and then there's a gridlock behind us. And so here I am, stuck. And I'm listening to the radio, and then now on the radio they're saying cars are being thrown off of the highway in El Reno, and the storm, like, the storm is headed to, like, O triple C. And I'm like, that's a mile from me. And I'm just like, so my whole process, I'm like, I just put my kids in a car, and I'm about to, I, I, just, I just, I made a decision that literally I felt at the moment I'm going to kill everybody. Like, I just, put my, I just put my family in the worst possible scenario. And people kept texting me. And they're like, hang in there. Uh, it's going to be fine. And my whole thought process is, I doubt it. I doubt, like, I see, like, I see the clouds swirling above my head. Like, this is no, there's nothing about this scenario. I'm listening to the radio right now. There's nothing about this that screams it's going to be okay. And some of you, you've been in some storms of life where people have said, it's going to be okay. And your thought process is, I doubt it. Maybe you've lost someone. Maybe you've lost something. Maybe just life happens and your process is, I doubt that I can ever make it through this. The disciples, they found themselves in a similar spot in Matthew chapter 14. Now let me kind of set that up. The disciples were with Jesus. They had just seen Jesus perform this incredible miracle. They had just seen Jesus, man, preach this incredible message. He was preaching all day long, right? So he preaches this, 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 this incredible message. And then, and, then, and then he multiplies a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish and feeds thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So that's what just is, is happening. And then we'll pick it up, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33. It says this. Immediately, and I'm going to just break it down. Verse by verse, it'll kind of take me the whole whole worship experience to go through this passage. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. He didn't ask them. He made them. Get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. So can you imagine Jesus was preaching, thousands and thousands of people on the side of a mountain, lows up there playing keys behind Jesus. Everybody's getting saved. It's great, right? And he's like, disciples, you guys go ahead and go. After he dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So, so Jesus is in the middle of the, or Jesus is watching these guys in the middle of the, of the storm, and he's off praying. Like, I'm all for praying. I love praying. Our staff prays together every single day. I pray on my own every single day. Like, we have the greatest prayer team in the history of prayer teams. Like, I love prayer. I love prayer. But there's a time for prayer and there's a time for action. I just imagine the disciples are like, Jesus, like, we appreciate your time of prayer, but now is a time of action. Could you please help a brother out? Like, storm is about to kill us. They're nervous. They're, they're terrified. I wonder if there was a moment where they were thinking, Jesus, here we are. We're in the middle of a storm. And you're silent. Jesus, the one who says that he loves us so much, is nowhere to be found in the middle of my worst day. You just did this crazy bread and fish thing. That's cool, but what about right now? You're absent when I need you. Jesus, you're not doing what I want you to do. Don't, don't, don't we like people more when they do what we want them to do? Let's just be real. Like You like people better when they do what you ask them to do. If you're trying to get into traffic, there's two types of people. There's one person that lets everybody in, right? You want to be their friend. You know, you like them. You know, they're just like, man, you're, you, you, you turn on your blinker, and they're like, another opportunity to be great to somebody. And they just let you right in, and you just assume they go to the church because the greatest people go to church here, you know. So you're like, they're so nice. They're probably part of the church. You give them the wave, you know, a little VFC wave. They wave back. Everything's great. You like them better because they did what you asked. And then there's the other type of person. The person that will not let three inches be between the bumper of the car in front of them and them, right? Right? They're the person. They won't look at you because they don't want to make eye contact with you because they're afraid you may suck them in, right? (laughs) What if I see kindness and i got to stay focused, right? And they'll they'll hit the gas and the brake and the gas and the brake just to make sure I'm going to stay so close. And you don't want to admit this, but you kind of hate them. (laughs) You kind of hate them at that moment. Sometimes... Isn't it better when Jesus just does what we want? 
No one in the room would admit we like God more when he answers our prayers immediately. Uh, but if he answered our prayer immediately, obviously we would never have any doubts. I've, I've preached and I've told you guys a story about uh, two and a half, three years ago, whenever we became an independent church and, and we had been blessed with this building, but we had zero dollars. We started over completely. And we were in this room. We were praying. We needed $14,000 to give the electric company to keep the electricity on in the building. We had nothing. We just started. We actually had $500 in the bank. We need 14 grand. Somebody calls me. Says, Can you stop by my office right now? It's one of those weird things where I knew I should go, so I left prayer. I'm praying for 14 grand. I go, I go to their office. Nothing ever happened like, like this, like I'd ever prayed and something like this happened. The whole staff was praying. Wrote me a check, $15,000. Not me personally, the church. Uh, $15,000. And I'm like weeping. Like, this is unbelievable. God, I can't believe. You know, in that moment, I didn't have any doubt. In that moment, I'm like, God is so good. That wasn't a time when God was, was trying to, to, to build my perseverance. It wasn't a time where he was trying to teach me a lesson. That was a time where he was just trying to simply encourage me, to let, let me know, hey, you're on the right track. But what about the moments where we pray and pray and pray and nothing? We don't want to admit that. We don't like God less, but do you? Do you trust him less when you can't hear him as much? What if we don't feel him all the time? You see, the, the storm that causes all that doubt is the same storm that when we're patient is about to build our faith. You see, Jesus, he goes up to the mountainside to pray in the middle of the storm. But here's what's, here's what's cool. When he was looking over the Sea of, of Galilee, and I, as I was studying this week, I, I found this out, and this is, this is incredible. Where he was praying on the mountain, he could see the disciples the, the entire time. In the middle of their storm, although he might not have been standing next to them, he saw the whole thing. See, some of you feel like, I'm, I'm all alone right now. I'm in the middle of life's greatest storm right now. So many things are, are falling apart. This has happened and that's happened and I, I cannot believe. Where is Jesus? Know this, even though you feel like he's not right next to you, he is watching you. He is on his way. He knows where you are. You have never been alone. And he'll never, ever leave you. He sees you and he hasn't abandoned you. See, Jesus always sees us in our storm. Verse 25 says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. I love this. He did not wait for the storm to finish before he joined them. He went out in the middle of the storm with them. That's what I love about God. God doesn't just pull us up out of our mess. We see throughout the entirety of Scripture, God joins us in the middle of our mess and then walks with us out of our mess. I love, I, I love the story of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I love you have these, these three young men who make a decision to stand for their faith and to, to stand up for God. And the king says, if you don't bow down to me, this will be your last day on earth. I will throw you into a furnace. You will be, basically what he's saying is, you'll be immediately sentenced to death. And I love the, the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They say, we will never bow down. They say, we know that our God will save us, but even if he doesn't. I love, what great faith. I just wonder along that, that journey, if there was ever a time where they're standing before the king and they're like, God, hey, like now would be a good time. Like, as the soldiers are walking them to their death penalty, they're like, I feel a little bit of heat here already, Jesus. So, like, like any time, like, we're standing for you. Like, like we feel like. And then as, the, as these soldiers begin to throw them into the fire, you're thinking, God, what, what's happening? Like, we, I just said, like, we just proclaimed you. We, we stood up for you. God, where are you? And then we see that Jesus wasn't late. He was already waiting on them in the middle of the fire. He was cooking s'mores saying, hey, let's do this thing. I didn't even smell like smoke. Maybe marshmallows, but not smoke. I love that we serve a God that will get in the middle of the storm, who will get in the middle of the worst moment, and somehow when Jesus gets involved, everything changes. 
We want him to be on our schedule. He's never on our schedule. He's on his. Jesus isn't, isn't confined to the time of humanity, but Jesus always knows what's best in every moment. Verse 26 says, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost. That's just funny to me. They said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Here's what, here's what I love. Everything changes. They're terrified until what? Until they hear the voice of Jesus. Sometimes we pay the most attention to Jesus when all hell is breaking loose in our own lives. When things are good, we don't always listen well because we like to take the credit for everything. But in the middle of the storm, we start listening a little bit better. Maybe, maybe God sends us a storm to grab our attention. Maybe God sends us in the middle of the storm because we know. Like, did Jesus know he was about to send his disciples in the storm? You better believe it. Jesus knows everything. He made them. It didn't say he asked them. He made them go. Why? Because he knew they needed to go. I love, I, I don't love flying. I actually hate flying. But I do maybe once every couple of months. And you guys that, that fly, you, you know, like, you don't really pay attention. Don't send me an email about why I should pay attention when the flight attendants are telling me what I should do for my own safety and security. It's cool. I, I, I know. I just know how this works. I get an email tomorrow. You should pay attention. One day you're going to need that. But nobody pays attention, right? They tell you your oxygen mask, if it gets turbulent with the loose cabin pressure, oxygen mask will drop from the ceiling, and then you put yours on first, and then you put somebody else's on if you have a child traveling with you. And they tell you that your, your seat cushion is a flotation device. Even if you're flying to Dallas, they tell you your seat cushion is a flotation device. Like somehow <laughs> that makes any sense. But they're going with the thing. I respect it. That's, that's fine. And so they... they they go through all this stuff. You don't listen to a word that they say. But as soon as you're up in the air and you hit a little bit of turbulence, what are you doing? You're shifting through the little magazines trying to find a pamphlet to know what I'm supposed to do right now. Right? You're locating the nearest exit. You don't know where she said earlier when she's pointing to them. But now you're like, you're not looking for the closest exit. You're looking for where the, the, the scrawniest people are sitting so you can plow through them. Right? Like, Big homie behind me, I ain't getting by him. But this this dude, pff, I get in front of that that guy, right? And then you tell you tell the dude sitting next to you, like, you better not touch my oxygen mask. Like, you know, that one's yours, this one's mine. I know it's close to you, but it's mine. Right? You start paying attention in the midst of a little turbulence. You know you're just going to Dallas, but you're checking. Uh, our flotation device is good. We are good to go, man. We land on some lake. I am fine. God will speak to you in the middle of the storm because oftentimes he knows we're listening for his voice. But we got to learn how to listen to Jesus over the voice of the, the wind and the waves. Verse 28 says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied. I, lo I love this. He still says, Lord, if it's you, who else would it be? Tell me to come to you on the water. Now, Here's the thing. What if it wasn't Jesus? That would be the best joke ever. Yeah, come on. Sucker, right? I don't get it. Verse 29 says, come. I love it. Jesus just, all Jesus needed one word. Come, he said. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water. Like, don't be critical of Peter while you're still chilling in your boat. At least he got out of the, out of the thing. At least he tried. At least he had faith to do the miraculous for a moment walked on the water and came towards Jesus. I think sometimes I, I always imagine this as he took two or three steps. We don't know that. He could have walked for 100 yards, 200. We don't know. Obviously, Jesus wasn't incredibly close to them. And Peter got down on the boat, out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. Sometimes a storm is an opportunity to put our faith in action. The storm provides us with an opportunity to have an experience with Jesus that we would never have otherwise. Without a storm, the scenario would have never happened, meaning that Peter would have never walked on the water. See, you can never experience a healing without first a sickness. You can never experience a reconciliation without first a separation. You can never experience a resurrection without first a death. 
Your worst circumstances are God's greatest opportunities. Verse 30 says, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. Cried out, Lord, save me. Some of you, that's all, th those are the only three words you need to know in the English language. Lord, save me. Scream them, yell them, whisper them. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. The storm reminds me we can't do it by ourselves. Without Jesus, we are absolutely nothing. The storm positions us in a place of desperation. I heard a story. I don't think that the story is true because I've heard it 17 different ways. And most preacher stories aren't true, so I'll just be honest with you. I mean, mine are, like, I didn't make up, I was actually in a storm, like, we were in a tornado, I'm just saying, <laughs> we, that's true, I'm just saying, like, I'll tell you if I don't know if it's true or not, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think this is a true story, but I heard a story several different ways about a man that wanted to be highly successful, and in his search for success, he called a, a guru, and he, he said, look, I, I heard you teach people how to be successful, I want to be successful, I'll do anything to be successful, this man said, meet me, meet me at the beach tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., Sure enough, the man shows up at the beach, and this, this guru, he says, walk out into the water. Man, he starts walking out into the water. Gets about knee high, and the man says, farther. Walks out about waist high, and the man comes out and joins him. He says, let's go farther. Walk out about chest high. Let's keep going. We walk out to where now they're standing on their toes, keeping their head above water. And this guru grabs the man by his chest and sweeps his feet out from under him, holds him underneath the water, and then pulls him up, lets the guy get a little bit of air, and then throws him underneath the water again, and then holds him a little bit longer, and then pulls him up, and again, and again, and again. And then finally, the man grabs him by the neck and says, stop it, what are you doing? You're going to drown me. And the guru looks at him and says, when you want to be a sex successful, as bad as you want air, then you'll be successful. Look, when you want Jesus, as bad as you want air in the morning, when you want Jesus more than anything else in your entire life, you will experience Jesus in a way that you've never experienced him in your entire life. See, I believe that God oftentimes wants to bring us to a place of absolute desperation. I think American Christianity, I do my best to bash it as much as I can. Because, look, read Revelation, we are the church of Laodicea. We're, we are the lukewarm church. American Christianity has added Jesus to our convenient life. It's like we want to do what we want to do and live the way that we want to live, and then we'll just add Jesus because we don't know what the other side looks like. And then if Jesus is actually real, then we just think if we just add him and do our thing a little bit, then all of a sudden it'll, it'll be good. Instead of living a life that is completely dependent on him every single day. Well, isn't that what he's called us to do? What does the Bible say? Trust in the Lord with all. All. Your heart. What does it say? Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. It doesn't say you figure out your path and then when it's when it's convenient, just add Jesus into that little just we want we like sprinkle Jesus. Just sprinkle him in. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. The, the, the literal translation is a starvation. Blessed are those who are desperate for Jesus. We want to put God in a, in a box, in a, in a formula, a blessing, right? We're consumed with, we want the blessings of God. You want to be blessed? Be desperate for Him. The Bible tells you how to be blessed. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Desperate people are, are dangerous people. Ask a lifeguard, right? Who, who's, who's the person most afraid of? It's not the little kids running around on the 
concrete, they're going to fall and slip, right? It's the, it's, 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 it's the drowning person. Because drowning people are, they're desperate people. When they're desperate, they become dangerous. That's why they're taught to just throw a buoy out to them and try to drag them in. Because if they go out there, desperate people are going to drag them down too. Somebody hadn't eaten in three or four days, or their family hadn't eaten in three or four days, become dangerous, not because they're bad people, but because they're, they're desperate people. Maybe God wants to lead us to a place of desperation because he's tired of our church being so safe, and he wants us to be dangerous. He wants us to be effective. He wants us to lead us to a place of action. Look, desperate people, they're, they're, they're people of action. you never seen somebody drown and that's just chilling and be like, well, this, this is unfortunate. Like they're moving. They may not be moving right, but they're people of action. God wants to bring us to a place where we are people that are desperate, where we're dangerous, we're people of action. God's not trying to build a country club. He's trying to build an army. We have stuff to do. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? I was right here. I told you to come. I got you. Some of you, when you step out in faith, know this. If he told you to step out, he's got you. He's got you. Even when your faith is low. Here's what I love. Some of you came here today, and you don't have great faith in God. I don't know if this is going to make me sound like a heretic, but it's okay. It's okay. Here's what I love about our God. When Peter had no faith... What was Jesus doing? He was challenging him verbally, but physically he was reaching out to save him. Listen, I hope that today that God is going to use me to challenge you with my words. But know this, even as I'm challenging you, he is always reaching out to save you because no, no matter how, how little faith you have or none at all, Jesus is still reaching out. The Bible says while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for the perfect people. He died for the people without faith. Verse 32 says this. When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Now, if I'm Jesus, and thankfully I'm not, if I'm Jesus, I'm a little irritated right now. Like, you guys have been walking with me for a while. Like, you, you guys just saw, like, the... How I fed thousands and thousands and thousands of people with basically a fish sandwich. You said that multiplication thing? You heard the sermon all day long. What do you mean just now you think, oh, surely he's the son of God. Like, what about before? But here's what's incredible. Before it was Jesus' faith. Before it was Jesus' instruction. Now they have personal faith because they had a personal encounter with the power of God. Something changes when you stop borrowing your mama's faith and your daddy's faith and your neighbor's faith and your small group leader's faith. And when you have a personal encounter with Jesus, because a personal encounter with Jesus changes your perspective of Jesus. The storm, it's an opportunity to build our faith. The, the storm also prepares us for what's next. Here's what Jesus knew about the disciples. These men would go out and change the course of history. A couple of billion people profess faith in Jesus Christ today. It started with Jesus investing in 12 and sending the 12 out. He knew that their worst storms, their most difficult days, were ahead of them. Last week we, we talked about how they all became martyrs. Jesus knew that he needed to get them through a little bit of a thunderstorm so they could make it through the storms of life. Jesus was preparing them for something greater, for something better. Maybe you're in the middle of a storm, not because you're being punished, but you're being prepared. Now, sometimes, to be honest with you, sometimes we're in the middle of a storm because we're stupid. Right? I mean, you're going to reap what you sow. You make a bad decision. Like, like Jesus is not a genie that all of a sudden you can just simply say, uh, hey, forgive me, and then the, the, you escape all consequences for your sin. That's not, that's not how it works. But a lot of times we're in the middle of the storm because God is preparing us for something better. God is so much more interested in changing you than he is changing your circumstances because God has us all in a process. Every single one of us in this room, we're in a different journey we're in a different process, but all of us are in a process. Pastor Charles, uh, a few weeks ago in a staff meeting, 
told a story about a bamboo tree in China. He said, these Chinese bamboo trees, they will not grow but a couple of inches for four to five years. And then all of a sudden, after four to five, year, five, four to five years, these bamboo trees will sometimes grow up to two feet a day. And so you think, all these five years, you think, what a waste of time. What a, what a miserable waste. I planted, I planted these trees and I see nothing day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. But when they start growing, the growth is then explosive. Some of you feel like, where's God at? I doubt that he is doing anything. I don't see any results, but maybe God is developing something in the root system. Maybe, maybe because what happens with these bamboo trees is the roots are growing deep. These roots are getting nourishment. These roots are getting prepared. Maybe God is preparing you. And some of you say, well, I've been waiting so long. Well, maybe you've been waiting a long time because your growth is about to be exponential and explosive. But the greater the process, the greater the result. People say, oh, this church just blew up. Did it? There'll be 3,000 people here today. Average age will be about 20. Count all kids, everybody. Average age is about 20. I'm not the best at math, but if you take 3,000 people times 20 years of experience, that is 60,000 years of life experience. What happens when you take 60,000 years of, of experience, good, bad, in between, and put it together for a common goal? People that have been growing together, been encouraged together, helping each other. This church didn't have any, any, any option but to have explosive growth. 60,000 years of incredible life experience. <laughs> Come on, of course. This church, this church you think about it. Only having 3,000 people, 60,000 years of growth. It, doesn't, it sounds terrible, actually. We're the slowest growing church in America now. What does happen? We flipped. <laughs> I don't know what God's doing in your life. And I, don't, I don't know none of you are 60,000 years old, but I do know this. Just commit to God's process. He's preparing you. He's preparing you. He's preparing you. He's preparing you. It seems dry. It seems desolate. It seems stormy. Seems silent. Stay faithful. He's preparing you. I don't know what he's preparing you for. I don't know, but I know he's preparing you. I know he's preparing you. And I know some of you are thinking, I doubt it. That's fine. At the end of this, he's like, I doubt it. <laughs> That's cool. I'll tell you this. I love it when my kids ask me questions. I love it. It gives me an opportunity to teach. And sometimes I love it when my kids doubt me. Like when my, when my son goes to me, he said, Dad, you can't open this jar of pickles. <sighs> Say that again, son. Say it again, I got you. I'll start flexing as I open it. Watch this, watch this, little homie. Pop, right? Doubt me again. What do you think of winning a fight? Daddy, you're a grizzly bear. Daddy, I got you. Don't you ever forget it, little boy. <laughs> If my kids doubt me and walk away from me, it's devastating. When my kids doubt me and say, Daddy, teach me. Daddy, show me. Oh, what an opportunity. Bring your doubt. Stop being so terrified that you can't approach God with as a skeptic. Approach him. I love talking to skeptics. I love it. And I'm not even that smart. But God, the creator, the sustainer of life, the knower of all things, bring your skepticism to him. Ask him. What an opportunity. Can you imagine being God? What an opportunity to have to teach somebody. What an opportunity to have to help somebody in their, in their process. You're skeptical today? Fantastic. Fantastic. Just bring that skepticism to Jesus and say, here it is. Here's my questions. Here's my, God, here's why I don't think you're real. Here's why. But if you're there, I'm willing to listen. Oh, and watch him speak. You think you're drowning? Watch him reach out his hand. You don't think you have any faith? Oh, he's still there. I'll save you. I got you. I got you. Maybe he's preparing you for something greater. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. God, we're so honored and thankful. God, we're so grateful to be in your house, to worship you, to serve you. God, I pray for the skeptic. I prayed for the, the people full of doubt, God, and I'm so grateful that they're here. I know you are too. God, they wouldn't walk out of here with all the same doubts. Or at least they would walk out of here with the same doubts saying, 
I'm at least going to ask God the questions. I'm going to try to process my doubts with him. And if you're here in this auditorium with your heads by eyes closed, if you would just simply say, I've doubted that God is real. I've doubted that this whole thing is real. Or you would just say, I, I'm, I'm kind of the American Christian. I never really gave my life to God. I never really turned from doing life my way. I just, I just kind of wanted to get out of hell free card. And you've never like actually followed God and you'd say today, I still have some doubts, but I know he is exactly who he says he is. I know he is. And I want to repent. I want to turn from doing life my way and I want to do it his way. I want to spend the rest of my life following him with my doubts, with my fears, with my skepticism. I'm committed to letting him work it out. I'm committed to letting him teach me on my journey. And if that's you all, all over this room, would you simply just raise your hand up in the air and you say, I want to I be committed to the journey. I want to give my life to God. I know he is who he says he is. Thanks. See hands all over, upstairs, downstairs. Amen, amen, amen. You can put your hands down. Let everybody pray this prayer together with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, I love you so much. Thank you for sending your son to live a perfect life, to die a miserable death for me. For me, so I can have life, so I can have freedom, so I can have hope, so I can have peace, so I can have joy, so I can have an eternity. I turn from doing life my way. I want to do it your way. I want to follow you. I want to live for you every moment of every day of the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would everybody stand all over the auditorium? There's communion in the, in the, in the back of the room, upstairs and downstairs. And then upstairs, there's a prayer team also in the back of the room. And uh, this level, we'll have the prayer team come down to the front of the room. I just want to encourage you. Some of you, you've thought about coming down to give prayer for a couple of years now. But bring your skepticism. Bring your doubts. Bring them all. Like nobody down here, when you say, I doubt that God can heal me, no one's going to say, oh, go back to your seat. We're going to pray that God builds your faith. We're going to pray that God heals you and God, God touches you. So whatever your, your need is, big or small, whatever your doubt is, big or small, man, we're honored to pray with you. It is an honor to pray with you. And I promise you, you will watch God build your faith even as we pray. And God will do the miraculous in your life. So as we worship, man, find one of our, our prayer team members either here or upstairs and allow us to pray with you.